I'm Ross Trelevin, and this is a very special version of our Spotlight series. I'm here with a very special guest. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Jeff Weir. I'm the Technical Director and now Technical Director Emeritus of Sprague Pest Solutions. I've been with, I've been in the pest control industry for over 47 years. So Over 47 uh, years. Wow. Well, Jeff, uh, let's go in the Wayback Machine then and get started uh, probably at the beginning. Uh, okay. how, did you, uh, how did you find yourself in entomology? Well, I found myself in pest control before I found myself in entomology. So that was, I was an undergraduate at Loyola in Chicago, and I wanted to spend the summer uh, there because, you know, because I didn't want to go home because uh, my parents live in Ohio, and I thought Ohio was really boring. So <laughs> I didn't want to go back to Ohio. Uh, so I was looking in the, in the biology department. I was studying uh, general, you know, biological sciences, and, and I saw an ad on the, on the bulletin board for a, somebody to spray for inchworms in the summer to spray pesticides. And I said, well, that's, that's some, that could work. So I interviewed. It turns out one of the professors there um, at Loyola had, does work the summer at, for, this is for Rose in Chicago, Rose uh, Exterminator. And so I got, took this job for spraying inchworms. And I started that in, in 1973, in May of 73. And that was an interesting, interesting thing looking back on it because in our industry, uh, FIFRA was passed in 1972. So all the things we worry about today, like licensing, following the, you know, the label is the law, all that stuff was not in effect until 1970, after 1972. So it was still going into effect in 1973. So I was actually started at the time when FIFRA was first going into effect. So I sprayed inchworms. That was a quite a summer. Uh, we had a 600 gallon sprayer, uh, four cylinder, um, big V8, V4 engine on it to run it. It was 800 PSI. I could spray up to the top of a 100 foot tree with it. Uh, fortunately, we didn't worry as much about drift back then. Um, it was a still not much of an issue, but um, it was also the year, it turned out it was the year that the uh, 17 year cicadas in Chicago, the brood was coming out. So I was actually treating inchworms as well as cicadas everywhere when I was treating trees. So it was a uh, Nearest experience, I, we worked from sun up to sundown, seven days a week during the season to make as much as we could. I remember my first couple of paychecks, I couldn't even get to the bank to deposit them because um, I was not off during the banking hours. And back in those days, there were no ATMs, there was no remote anything. And in, in Illinois, it was, uh, there were no branch banks. So each bank had to go, there's only one location for every bank. So it was a um, interesting, op interesting time for me. Uh, but then after I started, the interim season ended after about a month or so, and I started doing regular pest control. And it was a, um, I learned a lot. Um, I have to, you know, thank people like uh, you know, Bob Dole, who uh, was running the company at the time, uh, gave me a lot of opportunities. And Don Ressler, who was the, um, op the man operations manager at that time at, at Rose, really taught me, he was kind of a crotchety old guy, but he taught me how to do things right. And I, I always credit back to people who, who showed me the way at the beginning. So I didn't learn from a technician telling me just to stand in the middle of the room and spray. Um, I did learn how to do the proper applications of pesticides. It made me, I think it made me the person I am today. Um, I did my first fumigation in 1973. We fumigated wow. a, a date company with, um, well, actually, I did multiple fumigations, but the one that first one I was on was a date company. We were, I don't remember what we were fumigating for, but we were using methyl bromide. Um, so I had to carry all methyl bromide cylinders throughout the facility. And back in those days, we didn't have Draeger tubes. So we were using the uh, flame detector uh, to, to clear it. How does a flame and detector work? It's a basically a little, one of those little propane tanks. And there's a little, it, it, the flame goes on a little copper plate. And it cha the flame changes color and exposed to the halogen, the bromide and the, and the methyl bromide. So you get this idea that, well, if it's blue green, it's not ready, but if it's green blue, it is ready. Uh, you can enter it. So it's kind of a, a more, it's really an art to kind of adjust the flame and go into the areas and, and look at the color of the flame to see if there's methyl bromide in the oh area. Oh my goodness. But again, that was a, I was with a, uh, an older gentleman, Mike Feeney, who was a, who had worked for years in the industry. And he again showed me what I thought was a way to do fumigations properly. You know, we did the rehearsal, we did the, you know, pairs, walked the, the, all the route first, then went back and turned the gas on and did everything. And again, I, I was really thankful that I had some people early in my career 
that showed me the right way to do things. And that really carried on um, throughout what, I, what I, I do today even. Well, even today, uh, you were telling me about uh, some fumigation stuff that we, you were concerned was not gonna be done the right way uh, based on the client, uh, client need. And uh, even today, you're saying we only do it if we're doing it the right way. Yeah, it, it turns out, yes, exactly. We asked enough questions and all of a sudden, it got to be really sketchy. So we said, no, nah, we don't want to deal with this. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's exactly the right way to do it. And it comes from the early part of your career. So you started in uh, in college then. Um, what made you stick with it? Um, well, you know, it was the first year. It was, a, it was a great summer job. We can make a lot of, because of all the time I worked, I mean, we can make a relatively lot of money. And because the summertime is a busy time, it's less busy in the winter in the Midwest, you know, especially with the kind of company we are as more residential and some commercial. Um, but it was, um, it gave me a perfect summer job. So I did it the next summer. And, you know, as I got involved, as I did this, I got to know the professor at Loyola and um, I started doing my senior project under him on some with the biological clocks of hum, uh, with human, human burrowing cockroaches. Um, and I got to be interested in entomology. I also met Jerry Wegner, who was also a uh, grad student with him, who I still communicate with to this day in our industry. Wait, your senior project was on burrowing cockroaches? Is that what you Human mean? burrowing cockroaches, yes. But what exactly is that? Uh, maybe I haven't run into that very often. They look kind of like the, they look kind of like the, like the um, uh, what's the ones we have? We have the, um, the hissing cockroaches. They look a lot like them. Okay. A lot of those tropical cockroaches are burrow, you know, burrow in the soil and live in those areas. I had to, I built little wheels for it and I had them run in the wheels and I would, I could time with the primitive ways we did it. We didn't have a lot of electronics back then, so it was all mechanical. Uh, we could time when they were active, whether or not actively put them in different day-night cycles to see if we could change it. Uh, it was kind of just a curious, curiosity as what was going on with, with, I was interested in biological clocks at that time, which actually ended up starting me at Northwestern. I was gonna go and study under uh, Frank Brown up there, who was a, a, a pioneer in looking at biological clocks. Turns out though, once I got there, he was this, he, we talked about, he just said he was gonna retire and didn't wanna take on a new graduate student at that time. So I worked for a different person. I got involved with um, olfactory physiology and the lab was working on frogs and rats. And I started working on fruit flies in that, in that lab on olfactory physiology and, and worked on my master's there and, and started working on my PhD, but I kind of gave up um, and went to the pest control industry after a while on the PhD. Uh, but I was working on, on olfactory physiology while I was studying neurophysiology and um, which again, started my, my lifetime interest in toxicology. And I, I love, the part I love about our industry is the pesticides and all the insecticides and rodenticides, you know, they're all, there's a toxicology uh, all the receptors and the toxicology, how they work. And that was partially what I was trained in. I had m multiple courses in receptor biology and looking at hormones and looking at different things. And um, it was a primitive time at the, compared to today because we didn't, we were, were still, did not, could not do DNA analysis or anything at that point. That was just the beginning of that um, in, the, in the late, seven, in the mid to late seventies. So it was, but it got my interest in entomology there. And I, Kind of was self-taught that way. I, um, you know, learned about the entomology, started getting involved with the entomology groups, and then eventually, uh, after I was at Sprague for a few years, I, I took a, a number of courses, correspondence courses at the University of Nebraska, to fill out my entomology um, education at that time. So after college, then did you stay with Rose? Is that where you were? Where, where yeah, you I went to. Then? I was offered a position as manager of a of a branch office there, uh, which I took. Yeah, I think it was 1978 or 79, um, and I did that. I did that till till, uh, till my wife Jill was transferred um, in her job to Seattle. So I decided to uh, follow to come with her because it was always easier for me to get a job in the pest control industry than it would be for her to get another job. And she was working for the federal government, so it was a good. Um, she had a good position, so that's when I came to Seattle. I. I, you know, I, I, at that point, managing an office for a few years, I realized that I, that managing an office wasn't my skill set and wasn't what I wanted to do for my career. <laughs> but um, there are other opportunities. So did you meet Jill in, in college then? Yes, I met her my sophomore year. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. Yes. Okay. So you guys were married back in Chicago area then? Yes, in 1978. Yep. 1978. And then you moved out to Seattle area in what year? 83, 1983, June of 83. June of 1983. Now, when did you meet? Um, I'm not sure who you met. Did you meet Larry, Alfie? Who'd you meet? Well, I started working. 
I got a job at um, Kemi K Products, for Claude, working for Claude Weaver. Yeah. And um, it was an interesting experience working for Claude. Um, and, but, and as you know, Sprague purchased the American Pest Management in Seattle from Claude a year or two before I started working for him. And I was working in the supply end, which allowed me to meet a lot of the people in the industry in Seattle. Because I would be, you know, working in the in the store selling the the products to people, so I learned more about the products. I learned more. I met a lot of the manufacturer reps, and I met a lot of people in the industry. And I met Larry um, coming into to look at the byproducts and things. And and at some point, I decided to to leave Claude's employ, and and Larry contacted me shortly afterwards and said, "Hey, you want to come work for us?" So I uh, came to Sprague in 1984, the summer of '84. So what was your first job at Sprague? Service technician. I was handed the route. <laughs> I took over Bud Pless's route. <laughs> you really? Yeah. I ran, started running the um, um, South Tacoma Way, the, um, all the way down there. I, I did some of the uh, Pacific Ave, you know, this kind of the south, the Lakewood south end of, of Tacoma. I and also got in some of the larger accounts we had at the time. Um, what, what was your uh, service truck? Uh, initially, I had the big van, the big Dodge the big van. van. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mr. Zap was my license plate. <laughs> Mr. Zap. Now, did you have a 600-gallon um, power sprayer in the back? Like you did about a 50-gallon power one? sprayer in the back. Okay, all right. Point. So a pretty um, big one still. Yeah, pretty good size one. I didn't use it all that much because I tried to. I've always tried to get us down to using less material, except for like termite work and things like that. So. So uh, all right. So it's 1984, and you just started working in Sprague. You're a route technician in uh, the Greater Tacoma area, South Tacoma area. Mm -hmm. um, when did uh, you said you started off in pest control and then pursued entomology? At this point, did you did you think of yourself as an entomologist? Were you a, already a board certified entomologist? Where where were you on that? No, I was not board certified. Actually, I missed the opportunity. To, back in those days, it was as, as the AR registered. Uh, ARPE, Registered Professional Entomologist. It was a different name, but same thing. Um, I did not complete that. I, I didn't just didn't fill the application out, one of those things. I was busy working. We had young children. We had a lot of things going on. Um, I saw myself as a, as a, you know, the more I worked, the more I started enjoying it because at Sprague, I was given the opportunity to see, we had a lot of com large commercial accounts and I was able to get involved with uh, a number of those. And in 1986, in 87, I took a couple of courses from George Okamura, which really turned me around because it was like, it was stored product pests and, and George had a unique way of dealing with stored product pests and was very, very knowledgeable. And I kind of just took up, that was what I was really, was really interested in. And that really, I kind of really learned what he taught and expanded my knowledge on that and be, made myself an expert in stored product pests. And so I was able to start getting involved with a lot of our larger clients, our, um, you know, large flour mills and uh, baking product clients and spice companies and all different things. And, and it was as fascinating. I was, you know, chocolate companies. I was successful in finding the sources of the issues and by knowing the pests. And I really started building the, the company's reputation and my reputation in the industry as somebody who knew what they were doing when it came to these things. And that really got me more interested, I think, at that point than anything. And we always, we always were working on roaches. I also started working with NPMA on some of the committee work. I was on the education committee early on in the late 80s, and we developed a number of training materials. Uh, we even filmed a couple of the videos. We filmed an IPM video in, in Tacoma at the old Sheridan Hotel and the Elks Club um, in Tacoma. Uh, we also, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I worked heavily on Labels Made Easy, a video on, on reading labels. Um, so we did a, a number of things that were very, um, very interesting and very it helped me develop my 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 career and my knowledge base and my and my experience with different people and, and my networking out there because in those days before the internet you had to network personally you couldn't just go on and google things and and run through it you had to know people so it was important to get out and meet people and spray gave me the opportunity to do that by both mpma 1986 i went to my first copacenta echo committee meeting in fort lauderdale florida um, a real experience in a number of ways. Um, but that was, uh, I mean, networking with a bunch of people and really, those are the things that really helped me develop uh, to what I am today and what and I think helped to spread develop what we are today. So in 1986, 87, who are some of the people that are at Sprague now that you worked with back then? Uh, Jeff Miller, um, Bob Andrews, 
course, Larry and Alfie. Um, and I'm trying to think who else. Uh, well, probably Tim Gallagher, but of course he did. Tim Gallagher, that. yeah, of course, was here, yes. Um, but there were, there were, I think even Dave Smith probably got into it right about that time. He started working with Sprig at 88, I believe. Does that mean Greg Schatz was here too? Greg Schatz, yes. Greg Schatz was hired. I trained Greg Schatz initially. Um, he would ride with me every day. And um, I'm not sure he was real happy about that because I was lecturing about different things all the time. And he's going to know how to do the work, uh, knowing you know, how Greg is. And <laughs> well, you said you were trained by somebody who was crotchety. Maybe you were trying to return the favor. So. Yeah, maybe I was. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was still in my 30s. Come on, I wasn't that old. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, I'll just check it. So that's awesome. All right. So it's 1986, 87, 88. You're, um, you're now, is this when you really start pursuing then stored product tests and right. And, and at, at some point there, and I don't remember the exact, I think it was 89 right in that time there, Alfie came to me and said, you know, what do you want to do with your future at, at Sprague? And do you want to be a manager? Or would you like to be a technical type person? And I said, you know, I really wouldn't want to be a manager. I like, because I knew that from my past experience, that that's wasn't right. my, my uh, my skill set, so I said I'd like to try being a technical director because I think that'd be a fascinating thing to do. So we started doing that, and we we had the phase in because we were a smaller, much smaller company back then. So I was still I was running a route for a number of years, while also doing technical stuff along the way. Well, how big was the company? So we were we had the Tacoma office and the Seattle office. Were we in Spokane yet? We had Spokane. Yeah, Spokane. Spokane started. Actually, I remember when I worked for uh, Kemi K. I met Tim at a meeting and he was on his way to Spokane to um, take over managing the Spokane office. Uh, that's the first time I met Tim. But um, yeah, we had Seattle, Tacoma, Spokane, and then we had a small satellite office in Olympia and one in uh, Bremerton at that point. Oh, wow. They were Check like one Bremerton. person office. Yeah. You know, back in those days, they did a lot of um, house inspections for residentials. So they needed a, C a secretary or a CSR in each one to type up the reports and manage all that paperwork and flow. It was a big paperwork back back in those days. I mean, it was not like it is today. Well, yes, uh, that paperwork is still a big deal, obviously, in our industry, tracking and tracing everything that we do, uh, maybe bigger in some of our more emerging markets than in uh, some of our uh, uh, our original markets. So back then, the paperwork, uh, were you having to review all that stuff? How did that even work? Because as technical director, you were probably on the hook for some of that. Yeah, I didn't ever. I didn't really review anything unless some a problem came up. <laughs> oh, then I was thrown into the fire. You know, it was. I was running. I had full days of routes to do. I mean, I was servicing hundreds of bait stations in Tin Cast, like our techs do today, um, and coming into the office and dealing with with issues that came up and dealing with clients. And and it was about 1994. Was a it was a really big year. 1994 for me and and the company, as I believe it. Um, one of the first things that happened in 1994 is I was at home one night and I got a knock on the door and it was uh, Mike Campbell, our, who was a sales manager at the time, saying, we got this big client and they've got a pest problem. We need to go out there now. So I went out there and it was a large coffee company. And I went out there. It was the first time I had, I had dealt with this before. And I said, and then they were store product pests. And so we figured out what they were, kind of what was going on. We spent most of the night out there, you know, looking at things. And um, I, be, I eventually became a coffee expert based on this. Uh, because, you know, the, the way you become an expert in this industry is you go in and, and you listen to what people tell you, you listen to their stories, you ask questions, then you go to, the, in those days, go to the library and, and read about stuff. And that's what I did. And I go from knowing nothing about coffee within a few years, I was the they were sending me, I was getting, I was sent around the country to consult with different people on, on coffee problems. So, but 94 was more than just the coffee. That was one of the first things. But we also, Alfie and I flew out to Boise, Idaho to look at a large uh, French fry plant that had some issues. And we looked at that plant, met with the man, plant manager and decided that we were going to fumigate that plant and take over to service that plant. And that was the start of our Boise office, Boise operations um, in there. And another thing that happened there is I had been to a meeting, I believe it was a, nine, a year before. And it was, um, I saw Rick Brenner, Dr. Rick Brenner from USDA in Gainesville, Florida. And he had done a really interesting study on using contour mapping to predict cockroach activity inside, inside apartments. 
And I thought that was really fascinating to me. And I hooked up with him and I start, started looking at ways to use that. And one of the other things we looked at was a, um, so we, at, at the potato plant, we started using that process to uh, map out the cockroach activity in the facility based on our trap capture and trying to figure out where the sources were. Um, that year also, we went out to a, a paper company in Lewis and Idaho. Um, and this all happened in like one year. And it was a, they were having a problem with insects uh, flying in and getting incorporated in their paper, which they were selling. And, and the person, people they were selling it to would reject the paper and, or have uh, demand chargebacks or, or it was a big issue. They're gonna lose millions and millions of dollars worth of business. And we put together a program, Tim Gallagher and myself, we put together a program uh, to deal with this. And the program was based on, on using light traps to, to monitor and capture insects, determine where the entry points were, made recommendations for changing doors, changing the way the operations were. And that was a very a, a huge success story. After one year, they went from losing millions to making money um, in that facility. So those were three big things that happened that really changed kind of, and we've been able to take a lot of that information we've learned at those, uh, for those locations and apply it to other locations. So the things that you're talking about too, I think, you know, if we look back to 1994, I think that all three uh, major clients you're referring to are still customers today. They are, they are. In fact, that first one might be responsible for your notoriety as being kind of a copy snob. Yes, it is. Yeah, they are. <laughs> so were you a copy snob before you spent so much um, time in the copy industry? No, back, I mean, I, would drink coffee we would i would drink instant coffee though so that was you know that that was so it really was it was more of an evolution you, you started to fall in love with the product as you felt as right. you solved the problem exactly That's exactly very cool so that was you know 1994 was a, a huge year for i mean sprague we started expanding i believe it was a year after that we end or so after that we ended up in in portland and i don't the exact dates may be a little bit off but you know we started off and i got involved with so i learned the coffee industry we already learned the frozen French fry industry. Um, we expanded greatly in that. Um, we were working on the grain industry. Tim Gallagher has involved a lot of the grain, grain storage people in Eastern Washington. Um, and then we got into the cheese industry um, on the Oregon coast with some cheese makers. And, and we had to do some uh, really elaborate work at a cheese plant. Um, and it was um, including doing a treatment while the plant was in operation, which was a, took a lot of planning and took months to plan it and execution was over Christmas day. And um, it was a, uh, a process that really, um, we were able to pull it off very successfully. And it was, and it really helped us wow. again going forward. I've heard holidays were more uh, um, work days uh, back in those days. I remember, I clearly remember working on a fumigation in Eastern Washington and had to go get some extension cords or something. So I ran to the local, um, you know, uh, hardware, you know, big box store. And I said, why is it so crowded today? I couldn't figure out why there's so many people out here today. And I realized it was 4th of July. <laughs> I didn't even know it at that time. I was so, I mean, it never registered in my mind that it would be any, because I would work so many holidays. Um, and thank, thank my wife for sticking with me through all that. <laughs> because it was a, we were always gone. Those were, those were tough days. I mean, we were, we were driving everywhere. I mean, that was before the days of cheap airfare or readily available airfare. So we would drive to Spokane. We'd drive to Boise regularly. And on top of that, it was in the 55 mile an hour speed limit days because that was before oh, when they had the slow speed limit. So going to Spokane today at 70 miles an hour is takes you, you know, four, four and a half hours. Going then was like six to seven hours to get to Spokane. Yeah. It was much of a, a much bigger adventure. And Boise was all just a long drive. In fact, Plus, we had one epic yeah, drive, yeah. Alfie, and, Alfie and myself to Boise. We said, Ezra Boise, I think it was in January or February, I'm not sure. We were going to a meeting at one of our big clients where we serviced several of their French fry plants. And we started driving and the snow started coming. And oh. this was when Alfie had his first Explorer, one of the first four wheel drive cars we had in the, in the company. And um, we were going and going and going and it was slow going. And by the time we got to outside Ontario, um, there was so much snow we couldn't tell where the road began and the, and the fields fields ended, you know, so we couldn't tell where we were. There were trucks stopped in the middle of the road putting chains on. <laughs> we made it, we finally made it to Boise. The next day we went to the, um, to the meeting 
and half the people from the company didn't show up because the weather was too bad and they would have to driven the same route we drove. So <laughs> oh my it goodness. was an adventure. Well, I think back then too, I still remember when I was a kid, my dad got his first in-car cell phone and yes. his Ford Taurus and, uh, and there was like this big contraption, like the size of a suitcase in the, in the trunk, but then there was like a phone up front. And so you, most of the time though, you would, when you're on those long drives, you would just be by yourself off the grid. There'd be nothing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so I had my first cell phone after your dad did shortly after. Again, they, it would take them all day to install it in the car. <laughs> and, and the funny thing then was roaming was, was very different because if you were in Seattle area, in your home area, you could talk on the phone. If I drove to Spokane, I had to go, when I got to Spokane, I had to dial in star 75 and it would register that I was in Spokane. And I, if I didn't do that, I couldn't receive any calls or make any calls. So I had to tell it where I was. And it was, like you said, there was, you know, Spokane had service, Seattle come had service, Portland had service. That was about it. You didn't get anything in between. Wow. Those things. Oh, yeah. goodness. I remember having to keep the conversation with my dad under a minute because that's all we were paying for or whatever. Like he was, he was going to cut it. It was a dollar a minute. minute. It was a yeah. dollar a minute for exactly. the calls. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was too funny. Uh, well, you, that was a lot, obviously a more inefficient time, but also probably if you're in the car with somebody like Alfie for hours upon hours or all day, you're probably catching up and creating some plans for the future. Yeah. Planning and bonding. And it was, yeah, it was really listening to sixties music, um, <laughs> uh, doing all the things that we would, that we would do. Yeah. It was very, we did have a lot more, um, relation, you know, relationship building back in those days than we did today. I think, um, it was good. You know, it was, it was a lot of time, but you know, we were getting home. I remember getting home at midnight, one in the morning, uh, time and time again, just, um, because we would, we just pound it out. We'd have to get home. You know, I leave a job at, I remember once I left, um, I think it was Paul Idaho at, Oh, what time did I leave? About noon, a little after noon or one o'clock. And I got home at one in the morning driving straight through like a 12 hour wow. drive. So, wow. It was a, uh, you know, it was, we, we put the time in, uh, back in those days. So um, you grew up in the industry and you grew, you've already mentioned many people you grew up with. Who are some of the people you leaned heavy, heaviest on, uh, you know, from your peer group uh, to help with your development over the years? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think um, my peer group, I would say, you know, Ted Breesh, Eric Smith, um, Bill Colby was a, was a, it was a huge impact on me. Uh, Earl Hallberg with, uh, you know, used to be with Presto X. Um, I, used, I worked a lot with um, Mike Chapman and then Keith Willingham over at, at Western. I mean, there was a lot of people like, those are some people that come to mind right away. Uh, in the, in the university industry, it was, you know, Tom Phillips at from Oklahoma state and now Kansas state and, um, um, Frank Arthur at USDA, Rick Brenner at USDA, um, a lot of people that I worked with in the university and end of things. Well, you speak Gary, all Gary, of, you know, yeah. Purdue, uh, Gary Bennett at Purdue, some of the, the people. Um, Bobby Corrigan, of course, was a, was a good personal friend and mentor of mine that I've been working with for probably close to 30 years. Well, and you get to speak at a lot of those places too that you've mentioned and you've you spoke at industry events. Did speaking come natural to you or is that something you sort of learned to do along the way? I learned to do along the way. I was, I remember one time I did a pres, I did a hour presentation and I listened to the recording and I was appalled by how bad it was. <laughs> it was just all uh, the, and I started, you know, developing my way to do it. And, you know, I still get nervous when I do presentations, but I, that's one of the things I enjoy doing the most is, is talking to the industry, uh, you know, getting ideas from other people and hopefully sharing what I know to make everybody better. Well, if somebody's just joining the industry now, what would be some of the things that you would tell them to uh, pursue kind of at the beginning of their careers? Um, I would just, you, you know, get out and see clients, see problems. I mean, you can read about, you can't pre-prepare for these things. Uh, you know, most of my, the th stuff I've learned over the year, whether it be 
how to deal with the cheese industry or a brewing industry or the, or the flour milling industry has been going out there and seeing what the issues are and talking to people at, at the sites. I mean, then I can go back and read the, read the manuals or read the books or read the scientific guide and find out more detail. But I think my, and I've advised everybody I, I brought in, just get out there and ask questions and listen. And that's the key. You know, know, know your basics, but uh, just get out there and listen. You will then, then learn what you need to learn as you need it. It's very important. There's so much to learn that you can't pick it all up. But, you know, you can't just say, I'm going to learn store product pests over the next couple of weeks. Well, that's not going to happen because you're going to, there's things you see over, you know, I, I've seen things I've seen only once or twice in, in, in 35, 40 years. But that's just important to have seen it. The only way you can do that is to get out there and, and look at things. Well, what, so we've sort of mentioned a little bit that uh, you've got a new role coming. How would you describe your new role? Uh, my, new, my new role is as a mentor. Um, I'm going to be mentoring. We have three regional entomologists now at Sprague that I'm going to be mentoring. One of my primary roles is to mentor. I moved away from my personal involvement with a lot of the clients. I mean, I still, they still know me, but I've been, they've been able to work with our uh, organ, people in our organization. I'm also going to be mentoring um, everybody, from our technicians to our um, managers, regional managers, our, our account managers, everybody. I love to work on sales. I love to see new industries. You know, we're, we started in California in 2016, right, mm -hmm. I believe. Yep. And um, it's been an adventure in California. California has some very different things I've never dealt with before, like the nut industry and some of the other, um, the, the wide variety of, of crop types and and processing to do it. And a lot of it's the same. I mean, you get, you know, your cattle industry, your cheese industry, your everything, they're very, very similar in one place to another. But it's given me an opportunity to, um, again, learn learn more and just become, you know, more, more well-rounded. We're really excited about how, I mean, the mentoring you've been doing for years, I mean, onboarding, new development training, the road show. Mm -hmm. I mean, training and development and mentoring has really been your role for how many years now? I mean, forever. I mean, I was mentoring people back when I was a technician, when I, when we go out to a job and people say, you know, I, I might not have had the title, but I was certainly um, with somebody, I say, no, here's how you do it. Here's the way you, you, you attack this roach problem. Here's what you, here's how you do, how you do this, or, you know, really talk to them about what they're doing and, and help them get better. And I really think my helping people get better in the industry um, has been a legacy I, I really want to have. I mean, I've learned a lot over the years. And I, one of my goals now is, is to mentor and pass that knowledge on as best I can. I mean, it's, I don't want I don't want to take it with me. There's no place, nothing to do with it. <laughs> well, um, t yeah, not taking some things with you or taking some things with you, depending on how you look at this. Uh, you are known during the road shows for having a few quirks. Are there any that you'd like to cop to before I mention a couple of them? Quirks. I don't have a couple of quirks. quirks. Oh. <laughs> Uh, uh, did well, you, I, need, you, I need coffee. <laughs> true or false, did you have two Vente Starbucks coffees uh, yes, on the table yeah. at every training meeting? Yes. Okay, that's that's you. correct. Yes. I need, I, need my, I need my coffee in the morning. I need my quality coffee. Yes. Uh, um, when, when I was in I Seattle, like did you call ahead? True or false, did you call ahead to make sure we had Pagliacci pizza coming? Yes. I like <laughs> Pagliacci pizza. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like some of the other ones. <laughs> yeah, I have certain food preferences and, you know, I know mushrooms, no olives. Um, uh, that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I like to have, you know, and, and initially we started off years ago with, um, we always share hotel rooms because mm -hmm. that was a we're a smaller company with less resources. Now we, we've had their own hotel rooms. I like staying in, in certain hotels and mm -hmm. um, hotels. I don't you like to get true or false. You like to be at the airport a little earlier than the average Sprague employee. Oh, well, people just push it so, so hard. And I'll tell you a story as to why, why that's the case. I went to, um, in 1976, I went to, um, I was in graduate school, I went to um, Germany for a, a course in, in recording, anyway, electrophysiology course. And I decided to come back and I, was in, I went back through London and I stayed to spend the night in London and I had nothing to do. My flight didn't leave for like one or two in the afternoon. And so I just left the hotel. I said, I didn't, you know, back in those days, I didn't have money, I didn't have things to do. So I just was going to go to the airport. Went to the airport about 10 in the morning. I got to the airport, I was on TWA, and found out that there was a strike. I went to check in. They had a strike in New York, and all the flights were canceled. 
but I was there like six hours before my flight. So they said, oh, this is no problem. We'll put you on British Airways. So they moved me over and I got a boarding pass on British Airways and I sat there, got my seat and everything. And as the, the hours went by, more and more people came in and there were angry shouting and fighting and pushing and shoving going on. And half the people on the plane didn't get on the British Airways flight because they were there late. And that kind of was a, one of the seminal events in my life. Although I, I am naturally um, like to get places early, you know, if you're not an hour early or late. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, your, your airline airport experiences to me are kind of FIFO. You're first in, first out. As soon as that door is open, you're gone. Yep, uh, that's right. If, if it's a night flight, there's no waiting around for people in the back of the plane. You uh, and you're gone, and that's okay. Yep. You know, uh, that's so like you know, I I yes. The other thing I don't like to talk on airplanes, so I I remember um, uh, people sometimes people don't want, say, well, I don't I don't know, I'm not gonna sit by you because you know I don't want to talk all about work all day, and I say I gotta talk, I'm not gonna talk at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> That's funny. Yes. Uh, 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 in fact, one time I was sitting on the plane with my father and uh, in first class and we were not seated together. And uh, so the flight attendant even said, do you want to, us to ask if they want to move you around? I'm like, oh, no, he'd rather just meet somebody and talk to them the whole way. And sure enough, they did. You know, uh, he was not sitting next to you, though. Uh, so uh, your father's story, I have a great story. The first time I ever flew with your father, we were going to Washington, D.C. on the overnight flight. And I remember it was an old DC-10 where we had a two seat side. Yeah, And so he was in the window seat and I was putting my, my bag overhead and I was kind of talking away to him. I was a little nervous. First big flight for Sprague. And, and I looked down, he was already asleep before I was, got, was in my seat. <laughs> I think he woke up when the wheels touched on. I think I slept maybe an hour on that whole flight across the country. But you know, it was like, that sounds like my father. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're right. Well, what are some of the things uh, that you're planning to do in retirement? Well, if we ever get to travel again, with uh, COVID. Um, other than working, I want, I, I do a lot of photography. I like doing landscape photography and, and macro insects and other things and wildlife photography. And I would love to travel around and just drive down and spend, spend a week driving or two weeks driving around and going to different areas in the Southwest um, or the you West. Take, your, your background, did you take that photo? I did, yes. Where, where is that? That's Monument Valley. Those are the mittens in Monument Valley. Yeah. Very cool. Utah, Utah, Arizona border. Wow. Wow. Well, you I know that your photos are around Sprague and I know there's some, there's a, you know, it's almost like a shrine to you in Salt Lake City of your, your wonderful Which is funny. Yes. Area. <laughs> and then your face in the middle of it. I think it's yes. great. Yeah. Uh, no, your, your photography is incredible. What are some of the things you're going to miss um, about working here every day? Having a place to go every day. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you think about it, it's, yeah, you know, it's nice to not have to go in, but you know, you've been through this last six months where we've been at home. And it's like, you know, it's good to be able to go places and have a place to go and see people. Um, and, you know, I, I, I will be able to do, do that. I'll, I'll miss some, um, the interactions with the problem solving, the being involved with a lot of the being involved with the, the planning for the future too is something I probably will be less involved with. I'm sure I'll be doing the present, but I'll be much less involved with anything going on. You know, well, we're going to go into a new state. We're going to go here. We're going to do this. We're going to start a new program. And um, less of that planning stage. I feel like I was involved. One of the things that Sprague always gave me was the opportunity to be involved with the sh strategic planning. You know, I didn't make decisions all the time, but I at least had input into what was going on in strategic planning. And I don't see that that's probably something where it's not going to happen as much as I in a, as a consulting role. Yeah. It, it, well, I mean, what advice, you know, would you have for Sprague's leadership team as we, as we look forward to the future? You need the, you need the, the, the brakes and the, and the accelerator. <laughs> I mean, I always look at myself as a brake <laughs> and um, you know, but, but, you know, we need to accelerate. So we need to have a balance between um, aggressively trying new things and moving forward but also making sure we're careful to not put our ourselves or our clients at risk in any way by, by doing it. So I think you need, you need to make sure you have input from multiple people. Don't, you know, sometimes that wagon's running down the hill, the hillside, and you need to put the brakes on before it hits the cliff. <laughs> I, I, uh, I was lucky enough to go to racing school uh, a couple of different times and they talked about the most important system in the car is the brake. Yeah. 
And I think you're right. I think one of those things that can keep us from being out of control or keep us in control is making sure that we're doing it at the right speed. Yeah. At the right cost. And I think we've done that. I mean, I've, I've been very lucky to be able to do that. I mean, I've talked to my colleagues in the industry and they'll say, oh God, I have, they didn't ask me anything. They just started, now I have to dig them out of this hole, you know, this problem. And I've never, I haven't had that spray because I've always been asked and, and everybody's, you know, had as salespeople talk to me or, or run ideas by and, and that's been very, very much given me an opportunity and, and responsibility, but an opportunity to um, give input and point out things. Sometimes, you know, different people see different things. Um, you know, somebody thinks it's, it's a great idea, but then I'll think, point out, well, what about this regulation or this type of thing? And it's like, oh yeah, that's something else. And we need to just make sure we have all the inputs so we make, make the right choices. So we, we thinking through all the things you're going to miss and all the advice that you have for us, um, what are some of the things you're not going to miss? I'm not going to miss dealing with state regulators, <laughs> <laughs> with figuring out how, <laughs> when somebody doesn't fill out the report properly and, and we have to explain why, why they did, did or didn't do this. Um, I'm going to not miss dealing with um, OSHA or DOT or any of those, those groups. I mean, you know, I, I enjoy the, the challenge of, building those programs for like safety programs and other things. Um, I don't enjoy the idea when the regulators come in and they want, they start nitpicking everything apart and find every, every issue. You know, I, I think we build programs that are safe and protect our people. And sometimes they go, the um, regulators go beyond that. So not, not having to deal with all of that stuff um, will be, will be, will be good. Um, that's the one thing I, I think I probably think I, will not miss the most. <laughs> oh, Jeff, um, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm sad to see you cleaning out your office today. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a weird, weird feeling of changing of the guard. Um, it's a, uh, you know, this year we've already had one, well, actually we've had several really important retirements, um, another person from the steering group and, and now yours. And it's, uh, it's very weird for, for us here at the home office to be thinking about, you not being in that office or you not coming in. I know this has not happened since COVID, but a lot of times you would come in and sink into one of my chairs and put your hands back and, and maybe we'd talk about things for a little while that were on your mind. And, you know, it's, it's, it, I'm going to miss that. I'm going to miss that too, because that's, that's where I feel like we make a difference, you know, and you're absolutely right. With COVID, we have these zoom meetings and everything's scheduled, but you know, something we just don't have the opportunity to just, walk in the door with you or like Jeff Miller and just say, I got the problem. Here's something I want to talk about. <laughs> you know, it might be an issue. It might be something good. It might be an idea for, you know, moving ahead. It might be something we got to slow down, but it's always good to be able to, to run ideas by it. And then I can, I can, you know, sometimes I'm off, believe it or not. I I'm wrong sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that could not, that could not be. It. <laughs> yeah. That's the one thing you better, Better, everybody better earn, learn early is that you're not always right. <laughs> totally right. Yes. Well, and I, um, you know, when I, uh, in my career, um, as I moved up a little bit, I got to join parts of the road show. And at the road show was our, our training and communication events throughout Sprague. And uh, when I started to join the road show it was right about the same time Layla started to join the road show. And it was the Jeff and Layla show touring the cities. And, uh, I would maybe make it for a three city tour of a nine office, uh, you know, uh, road show. Mm -hmm. And you guys would be very funny. Uh, at some points you would, um, each be so sick of each other that you would do your own thing in the airport. You'd get there and you'd go this way and she'd go that way. And I'd be like, <laughs> you know, which way am I going? It's very funny. Uh, you always had, I knew where we were going to eat because you were already thinking about it before we flew there. Uh, I knew we were going to stay because you had your favorite Hilton hotel in that area. It was, it was tremendous. And I think that's really where I got to know you the most um, during my career was probably in the last 10 years of it. And uh, it's been some of the most rewarding time for me, for sure. Well, good. It's been fun. Yeah. I've enjoyed working with you, Ross. I've known you since you were born. Rather young. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You said 84 is when you came here. Uh, yeah. and I was two. So. Yes. So you were, yeah. And um, so it's been good to see, you know, see your growth, see the growth of the next generation coming into Sprague. It's going to be an adventure going forward. I, I am going to miss. I want to see what happens in the next 10 years. I'm hoping I can still see what happens in the next 10 years, but I'd like to be, it's, it's hard not to be part of it. 
you know, going to a new state and not have me be the first one sent in two months early to get my license, take the test to get the license. I've always been that kind of pioneer. I'd fly into Colorado and take the test, you know, two months before we open our office. I'd fly into, you know, California and get this stuff going, fly into wherever, Nevada, you know, drive in Nevada, get, get things going. So was, that was a, a fun thing for me to do. I felt like I was a professional test taker for a while. <laughs> Well, I think you were uh, a professional test taker in some regards. I know that the, the company, uh, you made invaluable contributions to the company. Uh, I know I said this about uh, um, uh, Tim Gallagher, but I think of the, like the Mount Rushmore spray, you would be, you'd be chiseled in that, in that stone wall as being one of the most important people who ever worked here. And Thanks. Um, it's going to be really sad to see you go next, next week. Uh, well, go into part-time. Yeah, I'll still, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be here. Yeah, Jeff Miller, I was, my 31st is Monday, that's going to be my last official full-time day. And Jeff Miller sent me an invite for a meeting on Tuesday. <laughs> and I, I called him and said, Jeff, I'm at least going to take one day off after I retire. <laughs> so we're scheduled for Wednesday. <laughs> that's, that's good. Well, that's sort of the Sprague way, I think. We, uh, we like yeah. to post you on the way out, but we want to keep you around as much as we can. So Yeah, exactly. So I'm really, you know, I'm excited about this next chapter. Um, it's a little apprehensive, but um, it's all, anything new always is. So we uh, move forward. Well, Jeff, good luck and congratulations. It's a huge, uh, it's a huge door to close and a new one to open all at the same time. Uh, a finish line and a starting line all at once. Yep, I tell you, I told you I'm making it to the finish line. I never know if I do it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, a new chapter awaits. Yep. Well, thanks so much for joining me on uh, an extended version of our of our Spotlight series. I mean, you were uh, one of the reasons why we started this to begin with was to capture your thoughts here uh, towards the end, and maybe we'll maybe we'll do a follow up after retirement is sunk in. Are you going to come back with a beard or do anything uh, do anything? Uh, different? I will not. No, that's not my style. <laughs> no, I never. When I when we were going through this whole COVID thing, I always got dressed before our calls. I put shoes on, did all these things, even though nobody would ever know, but it's, it's, that's just my the way I, the way I operate. That's the way you will. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we look forward I'm wearing to a technician's uniform today because I thought it was appropriate that that's, I really see myself as a service technician uh, and serving the customers. So I like being out there and crawling around in the muck and the mud and the dust. And that's, well, sometimes I'd come in and you'd already be here and you'd be in the service technician uniform and already be dirty. And you would tell me like, you'd been somewhere at 5 a.m. that morning before you came in meeting somebody to go fix yep. something. Yep. That's awesome. And your, your, uh, your hard work and your spirit will be, we missed, but of course, we'll still see you around quite a bit and looking you forward to, to seeing how this evolves. So am I. All right. Thanks very much for the opportunities at Sprague. And it's been a, uh, a, I, it's been a great journey for me going through Sprague. It's been, it's, it's, my life has been different. It wouldn't be the same if I hadn't and, uh, started working for Sprague. And you give me, a uh, company's given me all the opportunities I could ask for to grow and become the person I am. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see you in the next chapter. All right, bye.